What's up, guys? Welcome again to another episode of How Creatives Think. We are super excited that you are with us today. My name is Landon Hook. I'm Chris Henderson. And we have a really awesome guest that we are, we're really pumped about today. Yeah, we got Kari Mateen. He is, he's become a good friend of ours. He's a producer, multi-instrumentalist. He's a composer. He's worked with like a ton of Grammy artists. Worked on just about every <laughs> network you can imagine for TV shows and so forth. He is just a very accomplished human being. And um, we've actually worked with him before too. So yeah, the, uh, our track "Boss Man," if you've heard it, is 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 all is all Kari, and it's it's pretty awesome. We we love this guy. Yeah, <laughs> we we enjoy the conversation, so we hope that you do too. Hey everybody, we're back here with uh, Kari Mateen. He's become a good friend of Landon and I, and we are super excited to be talking with uh, with you today. And um, the question that we are generally starting everything off with is going to be, tell us about Kari Mateen. Tell us about the journey that this creative person has been on, <laughs> where this road has taken you, <laughs> and uh, just help us get to know you better. Yeah. Um, I will say, you know... <laughs> Uh, it it all started like with my family. Uh, they're both musicians. My grandmother, my grandfather played on both sides, all musicians, and uh, just music around the house all the time. I think that's where it really started. And uh, then from there, you know, you go to school, you do your, you know, music theory. You go to high school. I played in the orchestra. I played, I uh, picked cello in uh, middle school or elementary school. And then uh, played all throughout till high school. And then uh, my father uh, was living in Philadelphia. And so from there, he was playing at different uh, like clubs around Philadelphia during the neo soul era of, you know, like Philly musicians, Jill Scott, Derek Bardews, The Roots, the, you know, all of those artists, music, soul child, um, Jill Scott. These are people that. During my summer times, I would go up and hang out with my dad. These are the people I was around watching uh, make music on stage when I was like maybe 15, 16. And so I was really sparked by what they were doing. And uh, and then sometimes I was invited to studios and I was like, whoa, this is how they really make the music. <laughs> it, was like, it was like, all right, cool. I mean, not, like both sides is, is, is one thing, you know, but... You know, you see a live show and you see what they do in the studio. Almost two similar things, but one is uh, a little bit different. Uh, and I really took uh, a liking to what happened inside the studio. So uh, my when I graduated from high school, I went to, my mom took me to Full Sail. And I looked at the school and I was like, right at the the sign your life away part portion of the uh, of the tour. I I went and then um I called up my my buddy Kilo Saunders and he uh, at the time he was producing records for The Roots and other artists and you know he was around like people like Scott Storch and uh Mel Chaos Lewis, Anthony Tidd, James Poyser, like all these people I was already seeing in 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 Philadelphia and I was like yo you think I should go to the school down here it's like man nah man get your ass up here and tough it out <laughs> and uh, and figure out, you know, what you want to do, how you want to do it, and how you want your music to sound. And so after that, uh, I moved up to uh, Philly immediately. Uh, Quest Love's mom got me a job at the Ritz Theater there. And then that's when I started seeing movies that I've never seen before. I was like, holy crap, this is crazy. The music is different. This is not like an action film. This is not Tom Cruise, boom, you know what I'm saying? This is like different, different music. So I was working at a theater, and then I was also working to get records on the the Roots album. So that was like really my goal because I was super broke. I wasn't in school. I was living in Philadelphia, one of the, you know, from Georgia, a very cold place. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I remember living in an apartment <laughs> with no heat, no real, like, no heat, no great insulation. It was just crazy. Oh, it was like a place that my dad had, and he was like, yo, you should stay here. That type of thing. Did some records with them. My first placements were on Game Theory for The Roots. And I remember getting fired from The Ritz that day, the same day Sean G cut me a check. 
the biggest ke- check I ever had <laughs> because I was going to be on the next Roots album. <laughs> and I was like, this is the worst, best day ever. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is freaking crazy. And that led me to working with them over like the course of th- three or four albums um, and then making my own music. And I'm just going to fast forward through a little bit of this stuff to, oh, yeah. to, to now. But um, uh, that was that was the beginning. That was the start. The first chance I got to work on a film was with um, a de- director, Mark Weber, and his producer, Seth Shear. At the time, he they needed music for uh, this film they were doing called Explicit Deals. This was my first film, shot in Philly. Uh, Seth put in some of my music to the editor, uh, Jay Lieberwitz. He did the, the edit for that. Placed my music. I had to do more music. They liked it. It became the film that then was seen at South by Southwest by a director uh, in um, in New York that uh, he really he really changed my life. Like, because I started doing films with Sundance and 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 all that stuff, and it was it just was great. And uh, uh, from there, I kept working on the film on the side, then I had to move from Philly to, to expand. I moved to, I, I got a gig in, um, I got a gig in LA, musical directing, uh, singer, pop singer named Cody Simpson. And then that's when I moved to LA. You never really move to LA without a gig. <laughs> <laughs> you do not want to do that. Uh, and so, that's a big, that was a big thing for me to uh, make sure that I had something. So I was on the road managing the musicians and, you know, MD and those, those gigs while still doing like commercials for Sprite, doing like, you know, all this stuff, working with uh, this guy, Jenner First. We've done, we've been working for like 15 years. Like we've been, you know, we've done so many films over that time. And then, uh, you know, the, that, that, that whole lifestyle was already all the way up until the pandemic, man, pretty much, wow. you know, working in films and working with artists, going in different studios in L.A. You already know how it is. It's like, just do as much as you can to survive, essentially. Um, and so pandemic hits. My grandmother tells me like, yo, there's a there's a place down in Brenham. I'm about to move. This is our family house. Do you want to move to the middle of nowhere, Brenham, Texas, to continue <laughs> living your life as a musician? <laughs> I was like, well, it doesn't seem like anything is happening here. So, uh, and that was interesting too, because the world was sitting down watching television, essentially. Mm. <laughs> right. And that was the next biggest like move that happened in the industry for me, I guess. And I did a lot of films during that t- this four years, uh, essentially to where we are today. And uh, yeah, that you know, that's that's kind of like the journey in a in a very short way, you know. So, wow, that's really cool. Okay, so if you were to sum up, maybe not sum up's not the right word. If you were to just give a brief descriptor for each of those major phases, like how it grew you as a creative artist, what would that? Yeah, be? Yeah, that okay. Working with the roots was high pressure. High quality, excellence only, uh, very aggressive uh, energy. Uh, like, you know, this is the roots. This is, these are all musicians. I am 17 years old. Trying to be able to be around people like that, making music that have already done, like, a lifetime of work before me. That was crazy to have, like, quests like, oh, yeah, you use the studio. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what you make. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, that type of energy, uh, you know, have Black Thought come in and listen to your music, like, all right, yeah, whatever. <laughs> 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 it's like, then you're like, fuck, all right. Well, you know, it, it creates a, you know, so that that phase, first phase is pressure. And I guess that is where it is. I mean, I lived in China for two years. That was, like, broadening. You know, I, Seth, that guy I was telling you about, he started a, 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 they started a film company there buying and making films. So I moved to China for a bit, you know, working with those guys. And that was like, oh, wow, this is the industry. This is crazy. Like, they doing this here. You know, kid born in Bakersfield, California, live in Georgia, moved to Philly in China. That's what, like, that was the broadening. Um, then coming back, 
I stopped working with The Roots to be like, all right, let me do my music. Let me do my thing. Uh, so, you know, during that time, I was doing my own records. You know, that's that's how we kind of got into uh, So that, that that was a growth in it. So my own self-expression, figuring out what that would sound like, mm. that was that phase. Then it was, all right, you're doing your own self-expression. Now I had the uh, opportunity through Andrew Watt to be in a very pop, you know, place working with, you know, under the likes of like Scooter Braun and all of that, that whole community of LA people were very powerful, lots of money, high expectation, not unfamiliar, but in a different style of music to where I had to try to fit in, you know, working with the Cisco Adlers, working with the, you know, playing on Post Malone's record, doing like that type of stuff, being around Lou Bell, being around Mike Studd or Mike now. Um, that was like, all right, that was the glam era. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was like, all right, let's get, let's have some fun. You know what I'm saying? Being around the models, being around the, you know, the the parties and all that stuff. And, you know, picking up some bad habits and you know, uh, but still very prolific at the same time. Uh, I w also would call that the expensive era, you know? What I'm saying? Mm. Yep. <laughs> and the weight and traffic and, era. Yeah, the weight and traffic <laughs> era. The, right. You know, the fake ass people era, you know what I'm saying? Mm. But like still a lot of good people too, you know, um, that wanted to get business done. I met a lot of people, still have a lot of friends from LA and still go there to this day. And then I think right now, this is the phase of, um, is to solid this right now where I'm at was to, it's just to bring it all together and uh, like I have the studio built here now I think I was telling you that when I went to your spot that I was looking to build a studio and I was you know buying some of your equipment and you know I've slowly this is four years slowly gotten a space to where I'm having artists come in they're using it, you know, I'm working on films, you know, like <laughs> doing my thing. And then now, it and, and so saving up again to be able to have like a home with a property, with a studio, with a driveway. So if someone can come in with some land to like, I'm about to be 40. And then look at the rest of my life in the sense of, you know, where do I want to be in the, my state, the time. The, the rest of the types of travel that I want to take, the people that I want to be around, the people I want to be able to invite and have them be comfortable here. That's what that this phase is now. That's, that's really cool. There's a really interesting thread throughout that entire story of while you may have been like in a stage where you were developing who you were, who, what your sound was and to the, to the stage of I'm really able to express that now. There, there's a common thread of you and your creativity in the midst of what may have been at times chaos around you was it was it difficult to maintain that sense of like my own creativity my own sense of self while still having to produce and work for other people that may have pulled you in a direction that may have been outside yeah. your comfort zone creatively i think there there were there have definitely been opportunity uh situations where I was outside of my comfort zone, but a lot of people that work with me, they know what I am and they know, they, they know what I want to do. And right. you're not talking to me if you if you're expecting something different. Right. Mm. Really. Like I, I I really like I don't think I there's not a lot of times, and if it is, I will tell them, like, you know I'm this, right? <laughs> you know I who I am, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Let me clarify the situation yeah, exactly. a little bit here. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's not in a, that's not a disrespectful way. That's just like, yo, check this out. Like, you know, this this is what I expect. This is what you expect. If that doesn't match, let's not waste each other's time. Mm. So, it. so when did that develop? Because that's a very that a lot for a lot of people. That's a later development where they finally become comfortable with them. They don't, they stopped trying mm. to be everyone to everyone else because they finally just became comfortable in their own skin. Yeah. And, and, and like I said, a lot of times that's a later development. When did that develop for you? Or was it something that's always been present even way back in the roots days? Yeah, I, I think that's where it really started. Like when I first started producing, I was like, I loved Pharrell, right? And then like Rich, Richard Nichols of the roots at the time, he's passed away. But he was like, yo, this sounds like some fucking Pharrell shit, bro. Like, yeah, it's dope, but that ain't you. Like, what are you mm -hmm. doing? And I was like, oh, like, yeah. And I met Pharrell one time, and I was like, 
it, this was like years ago, and like Quest like introduced me, and I was like, and I listened to what they were doing. I was like, dang, I I really saw that he was like, he was making what he what he liked, mm. and so a lot of times, even when somebody like sends me like a brief or a like, oh, I like I want it to sound like this, I'm like, cool. <laughs> yeah, all right, now here, here's my version of that. You know what I'm saying? Right. So really, it's just about finding what that person is emotionally experiencing with the music that they're hearing. It's not like, oh, it has to be that sound or that drum or that kick or that. To me, it's like it's an emotion that you feel from listening to that type of song or that music mm. or that pace. So just identifying those things are the only thing I really try to consider when I'm like creating something for someone who's like, I want it to sound like this. You really what you're saying, you want it to feel like this. You know. To me. And that might be just my own like <laughs> Do you know how rare <laughs> that do you know how rare that is for a producer, by the way? Yes. Yeah, I think Usually, I think I think it's a very valuable thing for someone to make something sound exactly like something else. Cool. Do that shit. Go for it. Like I, I am not yeah. here to stop you. That is not well, my bag. Well think of, think about it. At that point, you're not just like, if you're going to be a producer trying to make someone into the best version of them musically to express to the world, A, that's a huge risk because it's an unknown quantity at that point because what happens if the world doesn't really appreciate that person? Dude. But B, yeah. you're actually improving another human being because you're helping them find their own voice. For sure. Mm. That's, that's, I think that's what, like, what it would, used to be. You know what I'm saying? Mm. It's like... The Roots did it for me. They were like, yo, stop that. <laughs> and it made me feel better about what I'm doing because I'm like, oh, I didn't have to think about like, oh, what would Pharrell do? What would this person do? What would mm. that person do? And then it was like, all right, now is it lonely? Of course. Not knowing exactly what you want to do or how you want to sound. And when you get there, it's like, cool. So I think a lot of producers find comfort in doing something else because or doing or copying someone because they can get there faster, which is... Mm. I don't know wherever that is. That that's cool. As long as you sleep well at night, man, go do that shit. I don't. I, I really don't know. You know what I'm saying? But, but it's I, not creativity. That's the well, key. Well, it's not me. <laughs> yeah. It's not me, and that's not what I'm gonna do. I I, I don't want to say to someone that that's not creative. You know what I'm saying? Like I w I wouldn't want to just jump off on a limb and say that. But I would definitely say that I feel a lot of comfort in doing something that makes me feel good, even if it's not exactly the sound or what somebody else thinks, especially if they don't know how to make music. Like, having, like, some person tell, like, if you're not even, not, not even a musician telling me, like, yo, this is not, you know, like, creative or this is not, like, me or you or, like, what? Dude, I just spent 18 hours, like, <laughs> in the studio by myself creating. You know what I'm saying? Like, in my opinion, creating. So, it doesn't get that, much more you than that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's all me. Like, really. You know what I'm saying? And then, like, honestly, I love to collaborate, too, you know, with people who are like-minded in that way, you know, and, and they bring something to it. I try I try to just, you know, especially uh, people doing what they do, like, do what you do, man. You know what I'm saying? Music generally doesn't hurt anybody. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> generally. <laughs> right, right. I really like what you said about how it's not necessarily a particular sound or a particular instrument or a particular voice. It's the feeling that you get when you experience that sound, experience that voice. And I would imagine, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I'd imagine that when you slowly started to, tra maybe it wasn't slowly, but when you transitioned into, into film and, and scoring films mm -hmm. and film for television and series and that kind of stuff, that's a really important thing to be able to have when a director comes to you and says... I don't really even maybe know what the instrumentation needs to be, but I want it to feel like this. This is the emotion I want out of this scene. Mm -hmm. Does that is that a freeing thing for you when when you have kind of an open slate with just an emotion to explore? Yeah, I mean, working with working with directors are it's it's an interesting thing, you know, because they they're they're doing a lot. They're you know they're from they're like start to finish, you know, they're part of the whole thing. And I try to make it easier for the director to. For have like having me be like the the character that they want it to be for the film, you know. Like I definitely when I, in that scenario, I'm definitely 100% my mind playing a role as like okay, this is the other character that they they didn't have on set. And sometimes it's really good to have. <laughs> sometimes they're asking me, yo, can you make something so we can play it on set? 
that's better, you know? Mm-hmm. So, like, we're all emotionally attached to the pieces, uh, you know, at the start. I think the, you know, for me, that's the that's the most important thing, working with directors. I think that's why I've worked with so many different ones because I think, you know, uh, I, I like, I think some composers, they make a, you know, the career off of one type of thing, one type of uh, director. They have a long line of, you know, films with that director. And I guess I do too, you know, with certain with certain directors. They, I think we work well together. Um, but I still try to make as much room for guidance from the director as possible. Like, mm-hmm. get me in early and you will get what you want. Now, if you call me like, yo, I need this film done in, in a month. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. Like, can we can we be realistic here? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that those are, you know, that's just how I feel about that. Yeah. Do you find yourself scoring? Speaking of the directing film thing, do you find yourself scoring parts of the film that have already been completed more, or do you find yourself being tasked with writing something that expresses kind of the idea they're going for, and then they kind of do the cut for that? Yeah, it's it, it's both, you know. It just depends on where the state of the film is. Some some people are still, like, in a financing phase, right? And they're just like, right. all right, dude, I got these, like, 10 scenes. Like, can you please, like, just do your thing do your thing on this? Sometimes I get a script. Sometimes I get, you know, I I love the challenge of all, everything, all things. Like, even if it is a month out, I'm like, well, that's a challenge. You know, and yes, I'm getting paid. And yeah, like, let me see if I can do this. You know, like that's, that's, uh, that's kind of, I, I thrive off of that. Like, it's the same type of energy that I had when I was working with The Roots years and years ago. You know, like they had a deadline from Def Jam for the record. We had to make records. They had a high bar. Do as much as you can. It's coming out. You know, like it's, and I love the idea of it's coming out. <laughs> it's mm. like... I need that too. You know, like we gotta we gotta be working towards something. Uh, and so for me, that that has to be fulfilled. I'm not really like uh an artist that just sits around like, oh yeah, do this over again and work this over. Again, bro. So uh, so if I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds like what you're saying is you prefer to work in environments or time constraints or any kind of constraints that yeah. forces you to not get in your own head, but to be more stream of thought. In other words, yeah. A lot of times people struggle with creativity because they're not able to get out of their own way. They're in their own head. They're scared about it. Well, maybe a subconscious fear of, what if I put this out there and then people reject it? And so they try mm. and craft it into something safe. And you're saying, maybe you have a propensity to do that if you have all the time in the world. But when you're under constraints of like, oh, no, we got to get it done. It's like, well, stream of thought. Don't even have a second question yeah. about. <laughs> That's tight. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm so like, I'll take that as, yes, yeah, you agree. The and like, and it's, it's not just me. It's like everybody should be doing that. You know what mm. I'm saying? Everybody. I mean, like, you know, there is a, at a certain level of like, peop- the people that you're around, all these motherfuckers are good, bro. Like, what, what are we mm. waiting? Like, what are y'all mm. talking about? Like, you've been doing this for 15 years. You've been doing it for seven. You've been doing it for two, but you're really fucking good. You know what I'm saying? Like, what are you... Why why are we stressing about this? It's like, all right, cool. Maybe have like a like, you know, I, I learned this from Rich uh back in the day. He would play it for people. All right, play it for people, see what they think. All right, you know, like different people. All right, cool. There's your little control group or whatever you want to call it. Get your information from that. Uh, you know, yes, think everything out, but you still in this day and age, even more so than back then, you gotta put something out. Mm. You gotta put it out to the world to for for them for for you to cultivate what the next thing is, you know. Because like I I, I do not claim to know what the masses love. I just want to do what I like to do, and that gets developed from what I see them respond to. I think it's a back and forth handshake between the people that we supply this to and we learn from and that's just ever growing to me you know and that that changes that could change in a year two years uh i've 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 worked in hip hop i've worked in pop i worked in film i worked in i like working i like creating i love cameras i love building things i 
love soldering things. You know, I remember I talked to you about, like, dude, I like achieving things. I have a probably, I probably have like a death complex. Like, oh shit, like I'm like, I'm going to get hit by a bus one day. I'm like, fuck, I did not finish that shit, bro. Like, what? That sucks. That sucks. I'm dead. I didn't finish it. That sucks. All right. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, and I and I take it. I take these a little lightly because, man, it's it's uh yeah, it's bro. It's not that serious. It really ain't. You mm. know, it really is it. You know, if you love something, you're already putting so much effort into it. Mm. So it's like, dude, do you, like how much you know? How much more do you have to give to for for someone to be able to like? Oh yeah, I can appreciate that. You know, I had a friend, uh, uh, he hit me up recently. He was like, ah, oh, you know, he's like, I want to come down and check out the studio to see if it's my vibe. I'm like, yeah, come down. Come. If it's not, dude, totally fine. You know, but figure it out. <laughs> figure right. it out. <laughs> so Kari's, Kari's uh, philosophy on all things is just shut up and do it. <laughs> yeah, kind of. It really is. Like, I mean, I, I built this whole studio, you know, like, and then I'm like, yeah, it's super expensive. Like, yeah, all right, cool. I won't do that again. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'll, I'd rather buy. You know? But if you never have done it, you know, mm. like you don't, you have no fucking clue. You have, you don't understand shit until you do it. Mm -hmm. Until you like fall on your face, mm. or you know, I'm gonna, you know, I I'm like, yeah, this is super expensive. I need to figure out another way to 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 be able to do this. The, mm -hmm. In the way that I'm doing it at this level now, whether it's this studio or that studio or buying this whole building or figuring that out, figure it out. Figure it out, man. Mm. Yeah. If if we don't mind, could we indulge Chris for just a moment? I I think Boss Man, the song that, that we kind of worked together on that you wrote and that we came in and, and yeah. we kind of recorded it together and everything. I still think of that as one of the most creative songs that I have ever heard. Like, bar none. I mean, it is just right. off the chart. I want to get into your head just for like five minutes. Yeah. How in the world did you piece together what you did? Because it's a, it's kind of a merging of multiple styles. And then you mm. pulled out the cello, and I'm like, what is even happening here? <laughs> like, the guitar, yeah. the cello, and yeah. this hip-hop feel with this L.A. Yeah. story. Like, I still get comments on that track. Right. To yeah. this day, people hear that track like, "What is this? Is this is so awesome!" Yeah, and I mean, I remember when we first kind of heard the the, the, the kind of sketch that you were doing on, and I was like, mm. "What is happening?" This I is actually think you were walking out the door after like picking up a piece of yeah. gear, and you're like, "Hey, yeah. let, let me let me play you this song." And Henny yeah. and I were like, "No, no, no, you can't leave now. Like, <laughs> yeah. you can't yeah. leave." Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Dang, is that is that how it went? Dang, that's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah like, and, then, and, then, and then we listen to it, and you're like, yeah. did you have to come back in like a week? We have to, we have to record this song. <laughs> and I was going out of town. Just, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like going to Italy or something like that. You're like, no, um, you're going to cancel your flight, dude. You, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this song time, takes man. priority. <laughs> <laughs> I think that song really, it kind of, it, it was out of like uh, the inspiration of the, Man, it was that's what I'm saying. Like, remember I was telling you about LA being there is like the kind of like the dark times of you know being around, picking up some bad habits, being around uh some bad people. That song really came from that just observation that and then it was like uh like I was being dropped off. I'll tell you a side story. I was being dropped off in the Uber and it was kind of clear to me that the Uber driver that it was dropping me off from this after hours I was in was a fed or a cop <laughs> or something like that. Wow. And I was okay. like, dude, this is crazy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you know what, bro? Like, this is like the most gangsters <laughs> shit I've ever been a part of. And I never went back again. But I was like, let me create a song that was an ode to that experience, you know what I'm saying? Put your cups in the air for the boss man. Because I don't know if we're going to ever see that motherfucker again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know what I'm Maybe his last <laughs> evening here. Like, All right, let's, get, let's yeah. go. You know what I'm saying? We're out of here. Um, you know, that production style too was, you know, I, I wanted something slow and drippy and, you know, and big too to, to, sh to show the weight of a person like that. Of the people that are that I was around, of the uh, of the class that you still saw in a place 
where most people wouldn't see it in. You know what I'm saying? So if for me, mm. you know, play, using a cello, using the guitar almost like in a flamenco style or a classical guitar style, that was just, these were all just approaches to, vi to, to try to visually, and I think you guys did a great job of like how recording me and playing that was like, that's how those rooms would look. Dark. Mm. Lights on one person. Feel energy on this person, you know what I'm saying? Like looking at, you know, you're probably the little dipped out high or whatever, you know, whatever you was taking that night, you know. <laughs> I'm not gonna say I was or wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it felt like. And that song to me just had a th that was the weight of the scenarios that I put myself in, which was which was dangerous, man. Very dangerous. And the song also has that too uh, to me. And like, yeah, I think, you know, throughout my life, there's been moments in songs that I've written or projects that I've worked on that really resonate to, you know, like a very, just a just a beautiful cross-section of, you know, me in the studio and how I felt at that time. And it's just like hits. It's like, they were like that. It wasn't a hit, but it was just like, to me, it's like really dope. If somebody was like, yo, play one of your favorite songs, that is definitely going to be top 10 of one of them. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So Ours too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 100%. yeah. Like that favorite songs that I've done, favorite songs that I've done. There's many songs that I like, but like if somebody was like, yo, Kari, play me your top 10 songs, I'd be like, that's definitely on the list mm -hmm. for sure. Well, I'd be interested to know because, because like you said, you, you, you gravitated towards certain instruments in the storytelling of that track. Yeah. Was there a reason that you felt drawn to the cello or to that flamenco style guitar or yeah. or even down to the way like you physically made some of the percussion sounds yeah. like mm, yeah. was there a reason like going back in our conversation like emotionally that you felt drawn to that these, these are these are all like skills that i have you know right so like this is just what i use to tell my story through music you know so mm. there, there you know there is a you know a physical you know, when you hear certain sounds like that, like cello is like, oh, it just makes you... So, like, to tell the story of the song, I needed to use that, like, those types of productions. I, I didn't use, like, live drums to play. Like, nah, this is like a fucking, you know, this is a drippy, you know, smoky room. This is a fucking, you know, the low end. Like, when you walk into, a yeah. like, an after hours in L.A., that shit is bassy. Like, all right, cool. So it was just really trying to tell a story of the boss man, of the, of the people... The, of the guy, the specific people that I've seen in these, you know, areas where they were, you know, these are real, real heavy hitters. You know what I'm saying? And mm. for me, that was, uh, it was just interesting to see. It was, and so I just wanted to make something that, that, that I would always be able to remember. Like, if I'm like 80 years old and I, and I put boss men, I'm like, Dang, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> Back in the day. You know what I'm saying? I remember that. You know, I mean, telling, you know, telling people like, oh, man, this is, this is what it was like then, you know? Uh, and that's what, that's what I really like about music is like the diary of, of, mm. of people. And that's why I think it's important to do your own thing because it's like, if your diary is making somebody else shit, then, damn, you don't really have anything to go oh, back to. Oh, dude. Wow. Yeah, you, okay, that's profound. So... Essentially, what you're saying is, is that whatever the art is that you're doing, music in our case, mm -hmm. that is your actual diary. That is, that your, is it. That is your right. diary. That is your creativity yeah. diary. Right. And you're so right. Holy smokes. Like, you are right. Well, <laughs> the, the, the really cool thing about that thought is if it truly is like your diary. Yeah. When you think of specifically what a diary is, a diary is only for you. And it's mm. really not for anybody else. And so mm. I know, I know, I know when you get into the commercial side of things, like you are creating technically for other people and for directors and for artists. Yeah. But when true. it comes down to just creativity in its true essence, creating for yourself and for yourself only as a diary entry is such a profound thought and mm. an approach that you can take towards creativity that that I don't really know if any other facet of life really gives you. You know, interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, like, do I just? I really do believe in staying true to what, you know, what what what's gonna make it for you. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's that's how I see it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, shit. If you find a diary out there, <laughs> yeah, if, if you read it, you know, you might see some crazy ass shit in there. You know, <laughs> which is, you know, like, like, yeah, like when you, but when you, that's what I'm saying. When you pass on, maybe like I have like a death thing, but like when I pass on, 
I would really like people to be able to listen to my music and be like, oh man, mm. Leo Kari was like, he was really, this is interesting. This is a crazy, crazy thing. And then like having these platforms like podcasts where you're explaining it, where I probably would never have been able to explain it at all. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Other than somebody interpreting what, you know, was said in the song. And I'm glad, I'm happy for these forums as well. But yeah, like this, the song should just exist as that moment for me and for the listener to to say like, dang, you know, maybe that listener has mm. a boss man in their life or a situation. Mm. So yeah, for me, it is for them, but it's it's from my situation that I'm that I'm writing from. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And so that's why I have to stay true to to what I'm writing. You know what I'm saying? Because it's like. Yeah, I mean that—that yeah. that is it, you know. Yeah, to go me. full circle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, hey, yeah, no, right. it's so true, sure. so true. I'll land this plane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that was well done, sir. Well done. Uh, so yeah, with that, I yeah. mean that—that's a great way to cap this 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 yeah. interview. Like, that's cool. man. Thank you yeah. so much. We really, really appreciate it. This has been an amazing conversation. Yeah, yeah this is here, man. this was cool. It, it's it's even cool for me to like you know like dive into. You know, because I, I am, like, moving forward, like, all the time. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, society kind of makes it that way. But uh, but I do just love that that push, you know what I'm saying? And and I really appreciate you guys' time, too, you know, having me talk talk this through. Absolutely. This is, a, this is a therapy in and of itself. And I hope to watch other people, um, you know, in the conversation that you guys have, for sure. Well, with Landon and I, it's more like tripping forward. Like, <laughs> trying not to fall on our face Yeah, sometimes forward. it's like, where's my flashlight? I can't even see two steps in front of me. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but it's, it, it's, a, it's an interesting journey that anyone who's in the, the, just trying to be creative in any field. Like, we want to get yeah. people from every field. I mean, yeah, even as something that you would imagine would not be quote unquote creative, like mathematics or whatever. Uh, like, which is I want, very creative. <laughs> oh, I know, right? It is. I've You're known right. some mathematicians that are some of the most creative people I've ever met in their yeah. own field, too. And it's exactly. And so just having the wide gambit, but the things that, like the way that your brain works and how it processes things and what comes out has always been fascinating to us, just utterly mm. fascinating. So That's I just cool. really. I'm honored that you uh, wanted to come chat with us again. Yeah, so, dude. Appreciate it. Dude, I hope this blows up. I hope, you know, <laughs> as you guys keep going and <laughs> and pushing forward. I, you know, I, I just love seeing people do things, man. It's like, we should not feel like we, you know, we have like a, a ceiling on it. So mm -hmm. that's cool, man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks again, All dude. Right, thanks, appreciate thanks it. Thanks for being with us, man. All right, man. Peace. Mm -hmm.